this morning. If you are joining us online, thank you for watching. Actually, this morning I am joining online as well because I am not in the church building. Um, if you're watching here in the building today, I wish I could be here. Uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed the fellowship before the service and then uh, the testimony time that we're having uh, before each uh, service uh, on Sundays is something that, that I really look forward to and uh, hate to miss. But this morning I am actually uh, in Minneapolis uh, with my wife. Uh, Jean and I try uh, to get away about three to five times every year. Sometimes it's just a day trip, sometimes it's an overnight or uh, we try to take a, a week in the spring and get away, but in, in light of everything that's been happening this year, uh, we have not been able to get away once since uh, January. So uh, my wife and I decided that uh, we had a long weekend that came up and we thought this would be a great opportunity. So we're spending some time uh, together up in Minneapolis. So because of the pandemic, it's hard to get somebody to come in and speak. So the board and I just felt this would be an option where I could continue in my series. Uh, people who are here this morning uh, can watch it on screen together, and then those of you who are online continue to uh, see it that way. So this morning, I'm going to continue our journey uh, in the life of Moses. Uh, when we left him last week, Moses was uh, before God asking to see God. And God said, you can't do that. I'll, I'll have to put you in a cleft of a rock, I'll pass by, you can, see, um, you can see me as I pass by, but you can't see my face and live. And so we have a story now where Moses is going to go up to the mountain, he's going to spend some time with God. And God tells him to chisel out the Ten Commandments again, because he had destroyed them uh, from the first trip when he came down. So when we pick up our story, Moses is with God, and they're starting to meet on the mountain to go over some things. And so here's what it says. Exodus chapter 34. Now Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then <clears throat> let the Lord go with us. Because God said he was going to send somebody else. Uh, Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. So Moses pleads with God to say, okay, God, look, help me out here. Uh, he, Please, will you forgive us? Give us a second chance. And then the Lord said, I, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people, and I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I have commanded you today. I will drive out before you all of the, and we talked about this, the ites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare um, among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their ashtrop poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice them, they will invite you, and you will eat their sacrifices. And you will choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters will prostitute themselves to their God. And they will lead your souls, your sons, to be able to do the same. And then the story continues on, and it says, when Moses, <clears throat> so Moses spends some time with God, and it says, then Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant of the law in his hand. He was not aware that his face was radiant, because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and the leaders, all of the community, came back to him and spoke to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near to him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whoever, whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what, the, what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. 
There's the story of Moses and, and God and interacting. I, 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 if I had to title this, I would title it Moses in a Mask. Because that's basically what we have. Is we have Moses having to veil himself uh, from the people because the glory of, of God shone so much uh, in his face. So before I get into the specifics of this, let me just give you a quick rabbit trail for those of you who are um, seasoned Christian and you like this kind of stuff, you want to study more of this. A great study is Matthew chapter 17 in the Mount of Transfiguration. Because in the Mount of Transfiguration, we see some similar things. We see Moses there. We see God there along with Elijah and Peter, James, and John. Uh, we see the glory of God uh, being revealed. Uh, we see Moses in both stories. We see him on a mountain uh, in both stories. We see this idea of, of glowing, radiant faces, the glory of God showing uh, constantly. So there's a lot of really great parallels between this story and the Mount of Transfiguration, but we don't have time to, to, to go there this morning. There are some things about this story that are different from the first time that Moses was on a mountain. He was, he was there 40 days as well. But one of the things that you see in, in this story is that when Moses comes down from the mountain this time, something is very, very different. And the Bible says that his face shown forth the glory of God. We don't have, uh, another thing that's different, we don't have Joshua in the story. Joshua was waiting on the side of the mountain for Moses in the first story. In, in the first story, the children of Israel were not waiting for Moses. In fact, they were out having a party. In the second story, when Moses comes down from the mountain, the people are there waiting. So they had waited for him during this time. When, you, when Moses comes down from the mountain, one of the things that you see in this story is the idea that the glory of God just radiated off his face. So much so that people couldn't look at him, but yet people wanted to be near him. And so Moses, basically, the solution was to put a mask on, to put a veil on, so that when people looked at him, they, they, they weren't blinded literally by his presence because he had been in the presence of God. So that's the story as a nutshell, and there's some really great lessons in this story that will help us as we go forward this week. A uh, couple of them. Here's one of the things is this. God's commandments don't change. <clears throat> in this passage, when you go through the whole chapter, you'll see a whole section where God reiterates a bunch of things to Israel uh, about what they should and shouldn't do. But when Moses chisels out the commandments the second time, Moses chisels out the exact same commandments as the first time. One of the things that you need to understand about God is this. God doesn't change. The God of the Old Testament is the same God that we worship today. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the, God, is the God that Jim Thomas serves today. God has not changed. <clears throat> Sometimes methods change, but God doesn't change. The things that were wrong in, in Moses' day are the things that are wrong today. And one of the things that, if you've listened to me or been under my ministry for any length of time, one of the things that you'll, you'll learn very quickly is that I put a big emphasis on Bible principles. Sometimes we get caught up in the specifics, and if you try to make application from the specifics, you'll get yourself in trouble. But a Bible principle is the same throughout every generation, every culture, every place, every time, every people. So one of the things that I try to do is when I'm looking at these stories, I'm always looking for what is the Bible truth? What is the principle here that transcends time, cultures, people, races, everything? And so one of the principles that you see here is the fact that God doesn't change, that God is the same. God gives the same commandments the second time as he gave the first time. Uh, the second idea is this idea that God wanted his people separate. One of the things that God was very explicit about with Moses is this idea that, look, when you go into this land, you stay very separate from those other people. You don't become like them. And one of the things that you see in Scripture, all, all, throughout all of Scripture, whether it be Genesis all the way to Revelation, one of the things that you see is God wants His people different from the people of the world. I didn't say better, I said different. He doesn't want us to do and act the way they do and act in this world. Because, from a biblical perspective, we're not of this world. Our eternal citizenship is in heaven, it's not here. So we need to act like citizens of heaven, not citizens of this earth. And that's the concept. So when we're on this earth, while we're on this earth, we need to act the way God wants us to act in 
consistent biblical principles in the way that we reflect the glory of God. And so I think those are two really quick uh, uh, applications that you see in this story that God doesn't change and that God wants his people to be different. And along with that idea of God wanting his people to be different, you really see this idea of the glory of God. Uh, one of the things that I think we all admire about this passage, and, and it's easy to look at this passage and go, you know what, I really wish I could be like Moses and reflect the glory of God everywhere that I go, that people want to be near me, that, that, that the radiance of God shows forth in my life in such a way that when people see me, uh, they're, they're just overwhelmed by how close I am to God or by my connection and relationship with God, that God's glory just shows off of every part of my face. And it's easy sometimes to look at that and go, but that's not a reality because I'm not going to get to be on a mountain with God for 40 days and, and, and all of that. And sometimes it's easy to do that. But one of the things that you got to understand is that this idea of the glory of God has a New Testament application. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, it is really, if there's one Bible chapter that uh, I, I probably go to more than any other chapter in the Bible, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because it's about ministry. And so in my life, that's, that, that, that's a big idea. That's a big concept. So as we get to this story, as we get to this idea of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, one of the things that you see is you see this concept of the glory of God. And you see it illustrated throughout all of chapters 3 and 4. And so when Paul writes to the Corinthian church, there's an issue. Uh, there are a lot of issues with the Corinthian church. It was a really messed up church. So Paul writes to them to try to get so many things corrected in it. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he deals with this concept that we're talking about of the glory of God in our lives. And then and what I want to do is I want to take some, I want to look at the passage and then I want to make some parallels between Exodus chapter 34 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So with that in mind, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and here's what it says. <clears throat> because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us also with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. So he says, your, your job and my job is to, to reflect the glory of God. Therefore, <clears throat> we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, <clears throat> but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Here's, here's the idea, and, and this is the concept that Paul uh, tries to reiterate in 2 second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, the whole chapter is about ministry and, and about how God uses us and how God works and why God's chosen to use us as human beings. But in, this, in, 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 in Exodus, you see... You see these different parallels between Exodus chapter 34 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, in the book of Exodus, for instance, one of the things that you see is that Moses has to veil his face from the glory of God because of the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians, it says Satan is the one who has, who has veiled the hearts of men, who's blinded their eyes so that they can't, or blinded their minds so that they can't see. Uh, God in, in their lives. Um, in the book of Exodus, the covenant was revealed to Moses. In uh, 2 Corinthians, the covenant is revealed in Jesus Christ. Um, in, the book of Mo in, in the book of Exodus, Moses' authority is two tablets. In the book of Corinthians, God's authority is revealed in, in our hearts, in, in, in our lives. In, uh, Mo in Exodus, Moses is the one who shows forth the glory of God. In Corinthians, we are the ones who show forth the glory of God. So here's, here's the thing. Let me drill it down for you for a second. In Exodus, 
Moses spends time with God and comes down off the mountain, and the glory of God is so overwhelming in his life that he has to put on a mask, he has to put on a veil, because the people, they want to be close to him, but the glory is just so overwhelming. In the book of Corinthians, Paul argues this. The glory of God is shown in our lives today. In other words, there's not a Moses coming down from the mountain now. There is a Christian who walks out into the world responding the way God wants them to respond in such a way that people see God or Christ in them. That's the story. One of the things that troubles a lot of people right now is <clears throat> this idea that um, Christians seem somewhat flippant about maybe this coronavirus thing or this pandemic because they're not taking it seriously, that, that, that they, they could die from it. What, what you need to understand is that it's, it's not that we're flippant, it's not that we're, we're unsympathetic or we're uncaring, but the issue for us, the issue for believers is this, death is not a big deal to us. Death for a Christian is stepping from this world into a world with my Savior. It's stepping from a seen world into an unseen world. Death for me does not hold fear. Death has no power over me as a Christian. Because I know that, 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 that my, and this is what Paul argues at the beginning of this uh, passage that we just read, that it, I'm okay. I'm, the glory of God is, is going to be revealed one day when I step into his presence. So for me, death by coronavirus or car accident or heart attack or, or, or whatever does not hold the fear over me that it does many other people because too many people don't know what's going to happen when they die. But for me as a believer, I know what's going to happen. I know that, that absent from my body is present with the Lord. So for me, it's not that I'm afraid of dying. It's the idea that uh, I'm looking forward to the day that I leave this earth to go to be with my Savior. And I have that confidence and that hope and that assurance. And if you don't have that confidence, hope, and assurance, I understand your fear. I really do. But for those of us that have that hope and assurance, it is offered to anyone who wants to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, you can have that kind of assurance. It's our prayer that you, you, you get that. It's our prayer that you put your faith and trust in Christ. But for us, it doesn't hold the fear and the power that it does over so many people in this world right now. But what Paul says is you need to understand, because you have that hope, because you know that, that that's uh, assured, be careful about losing heart. Be careful about putting things in such a context that you miss what God is at work doing. Because what God wants to do is he wants to show forth his glory in your life. And so one of the things that Paul says is he talks about this thing and he says, you have to understand that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's our idea. Paul says, here's what you need to understand. Paul said, what you're going through right now, the difficulty, the struggle, um, the, the hardship that you're going through, whether it's mental, spiritual, emotional, uh, financial, uh, job-related, family-related, Paul said, look, you need to understand that that affliction, that difficulty, that hardship is light. Now you're sitting there going, Pastor, wait a minute, you, you, you don't live in my world. This thing, I, I'm losing sleep at night, I'm no, 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 no. no. Paul said, in the big picture, you need to understand, this is a light deal compared to what God's using it for in eternity. When you take, and so Paul said, look, when you take what you're going through right now, which is going to happen for a very short amount of time, let's say you struggle with something for, for a couple of months, or maybe years, or maybe even a lifetime. Paul said, when you put that on a scale, all of that struggle, all of that hardship, all of that affliction, all of that difficulty... And you put on a scale, <clears throat> if you will respond in a biblical way, how God uses that in the lives of people for eternity. Paul said, the scale goes right now from this heavy thing that you see to go like this. That God's glory and what God is doing through that so far outweighs this affliction that when you put them on a scale, this is light and this is heavy. And he says, when you put it on a scale... This is for a moment. This is for eternity. He said, what you're going, let's say you have it for a lifetime. Let's say that what your, your struggle is a 60, 70 year struggle. Paul said, put that on the scale, your 60, 70 year struggle, and eternity. And the scale goes like this. 
Paul said, because what you need to understand is that God wants to use your difficulty, your hardship, your struggle, whatever it is that you're going through right now, so that if you can respond in a biblical way, if you can handle it in the way that God wants his people, his Christian people to handle it, what happens is the glory of God is shown because people step back and they go, I don't know how come they have that attitude. I don't understand how they're handling it that way. I don't know why they have that, abil- that ability. I want to be able to handle my difficulties the way they're handling theirs. Paul said our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. He says, when you put those two things on a scale, that God takes your short time on this earth of 60, 70, 80 years maybe, and God uses it to accomplish things for all of eternity? He said, that's how the glory of God is shown. It's not Moses coming down on a mountain anymore. It's you walking out into the world acting like a Christian, being different from them, being separate, honoring God's commands. It's you living out your life. So when, when people want to be angry and mad, and you're kind, tenderhearted, gentle, forgiving. All of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. He says, that's what you need to understand, that when we go out in the world and live like that and act like that, the glory of God is shown. And the more we can do that, it gets to a point that people start going, you know what, I I just kind of want to hang around them because they're different. They handle stuff differently. When I'm around that person, I'm encouraged. When I'm around that person, I'm built up. When I'm around that person, I start to think of life differently. That's what Paul's saying. He says, look, the glory of God can be shown. And then he says, while we look not at that which is seen... For that which is seen is temporary, but that which is not seen is eternal. Paul said, God has this thing at work here where you and I, and this is what happens for all of us, we tend to focus on that which we see. And there's a whole unseen world of God at work where his glory is being shown in the way that we respond. And that's what Paul challenges us to do. He said, be careful about spending all of your time focused on that which you see. You don't know where God is at work. You don't know what God is doing. You have to open your eyes to that which is, which, which is past that which you see. Uh, this past week we had a board meeting, and one of the things we were talking about was what we were seeing God at work doing, where we were trying to figure out and, and seeing God do things. And one of the things that's happened is, through this, one of the things that we're noticing is that we are seeing, the peop- we are seeing people being drawn and connected at a level that we haven't seen for a long time. Uh, what was happening is, uh, as the church was starting to grow, we were starting to get more people, but we weren't as close as we used to be. Now, because, because of what's happened, we're starting to find that people are starting to get closer and connected and sharing. And, and it's like I shared with the board. You know, I can only remember certain times in a ministry where I saw that kind of depth with the relationships that we're having. You know, it used to be when we first started and then when we were doing the building programs and on mission trips, but now I'm starting to see it here. And so we were talking about as a board how we can encourage that and how we can really uh, facilitate uh, those relationships being developed. So we're we're working with some things to try to get that to be a uh, really a, a solid foundation during this time. So instead of looking at all the issues that 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 are negative and critical, we're saying, okay, let's take advantage of this incredible gift that God's given us during this time. So we're starting to do some things, like I say, that, that I have missed, um, like, like testimonies before, uh, before we get to the preaching part, where people are sharing what God's doing in their lives during the week. And, and, and that's exciting for us. That's, it, it's one of my favorite times now of the Sunday morning service. And so one of the things that's happening is, is, is that we're trying to see where that, those unseen things that God's doing behind the scene so that we can encourage it in order for the glory of God to go forth in the community so that people can see Christ in us. And I want to challenge you this week because we read a story like this and we're thinking, you know, it would be so awesome to, to, to have that kind of, uh, of connection with people where people see God in me in such a way that, that they want to be near me and they, they, want, they come to me about Christ and they want to know more about God. And, it would be, and, and what I'm trying to get across here this morning is you and I have that opportunity every day. Instead of focusing on our struggles, which are, according to Paul, light when compared to what God's doing in eternity, instead of struggling on um, the, the, those, those hardships that we're going through, realizing they're just for a season, and God's working something that is unseen that will go on for all of eternity. When we start to step back and say, all right, Lord, help me 
to respond in such a way all day long that people start to see you in me. Um, one of the things that happened this past week in our own lives, uh, we're going to Minneapolis, and for those of you who know me, whenever I get an opportunity, um, I like to step out of the box. And so for me, a great vacation, a great getaway is defined by how many waivers you have to sign. And uh, so I was talking to my wife about some things that we could do while we're up there in, in Minneapolis. And one of the things is, is this uh, thing called indoor skydiving, where you get into this tube and they, they shoot air up and you get afloat for about a minute or so and then come back down. And, and so I, I talked my wife into being able to do this. And so we were talking after church one Sunday and we found that there was another family who's going to be up in Minneapolis the same time that we were. And my wife told them about what we were going to do, thinking that the kids might want to do it with me so that she wouldn't have to do it. And I just said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. We'll just all do it. So this week I set it up, and, and there were some problems with the online registration thing of all of this, and uh, ended up being kind of a mess. And so I, I got on the phone, finally I got a hold of somebody on Wednesday, and I, I spent some time on the phone with this gal and said, okay, here's, here's all this information that you need and everything else. And she was like, well, you know, we're really sorry this happened. Is there something that, you know, what would you like us to do? I said, look, I said, I, I don't care what you do. I said, I, I don't, I, what, what will make this easiest for you? You know what I, want to, what I want to happen. I said, what's the easiest way on your end of it to do this? And she said, you know what, I, I'm just really sorry about this. I will call you back and I will figure something out. And I said, fine, there's no hurry on it. I said, we're okay with this and, and all of that. And so uh, she called me back, it was like 10 minutes later. She said, look, here's what I started to realize. Our reservation system, there's a snag in it and it creates this and this is what happened and I'm really, 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 really sorry. She said, so what would you like me to, I said, what's easiest for you? She said, well, this is the easiest for us to do on our end. I said, then let's do that. And she said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And she said, and then she got back on the phone. She said, listen, she said, I want you to know she said, I, I, I so appreciate the way that you have handled all this. And she said, here's what I'm going to do for you. And so she added all this stuff to this package for us. And, and I said, you don't need to do that. I won't even use some of that stuff. But she's like, I just want to do this. She said, I, I appreciate so much. That I'm sorry for the mess up. And she said, I appreciate so much the way you've, you, you've been patient and everything. And I said, look, it's no big deal. She said, by the way, she said, I'm the one who stands at the door, I'm, I manage a place, she said, I'll be the one to meet you um, on Saturday. And I said, that's great, I'm looking forward to it. And I, it was just a simple thing. It was a simple thing, folks, to just be kind, generous, understanding, patient, and all of that in, in working with somebody who has to deal with the public every single day. And it's a way now that when I go and actually meet her on Saturday, if she finds out later that I'm a Christian or that I'm a pastor, she's not going to be shocked. Why? Because I have an opportunity to reflect the glory of God in the way that I responded, in the way that I don't. It's those little things. And that simple little thing could have an eternal impact on her life and the life of others for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Why? Because what you're going through, what you're going through right now, is temporary. But God is at work and wants to use it to accomplish something far greater. This whole pandemic thing, this whole coronavirus thing, all this thing, look, it's a temporary thing. Eventually, we will move on to something else. The whole politic thing going on, eventually, we'll move on to something else. But during that time, we have an opportunity to reflect the glory of God in the way that we handle it. So as you head into this week, um, here's my Here's my challenge. Here's the thing. Moses reflects the glory of God because he spends time with God. People notice something remarkably different. God has chosen to use Christ through us to show the glory of God to the world. Difficult times and struggles. Allow the world to see God's glory as we respond in ways that show forth God's work in our lives. Don't lose heart. God is at work using you for his glory as you faithfully follow him. Let him use you this week. Let's pray. Lord, help us. God, it's easy sometimes to get so caught up in our world, to get so frustrated, to get so upset, to get so um, focused on something other than glorifying you in our response. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us this week 
That, Lord, as we go forward, as we go into this world this week, that people would be able to see Christ in us. That, Lord, as we want to respond in a way, Lord, that is not from uh, you, that, Lord, you would help us to just take a deep breath and to really think about the opportunity we have in front of us to handle it in the same way that you would have handled it. Uh, So, Lord, just use us. May people see the glory uh, of you in our lives. May they see you in us. And Lord, ultimately, may they come to know you um, as we know you. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Well, Lord bless you. Uh, hopefully everything for in my life is uh, uh, back to normal next, next Sunday. And uh, we intend to be here. And uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, some uh, indoor skydiving story for you as well. Uh, Lord bless you. Let God use you. Have a great week.